it's a good opportunity. Thanks for the opportunity. In the beginning of this year, we received uh, from the Brazilian government uh, the announcement that we have four opportunities to go abroad or four opportunities to create connections with the international uh, university. The idea is to like, boost our quality, but at the same time create a good connection with another agricultural college similar with us. And then we, get together, uh, we got together, uh, me and uh, my colleagues and me, and we decided to choose this co the quad college to spend our efforts and analyze the research lines and analyze the professors we chose, we chose uh, Queensland University. Because we, have, uh, we are in almost the same latitude, we have almost the same wet kind of weather, work on the same ki kind of crops like sugarcane, sorghum, corn, and some like wheat or the self pollinated uh, crops. So the idea is to, uh, the, for my, my visit is to stay here for two weeks, create these first connections, create these first uh, talks, and then over the years trying to increase the number of visitors to, uh, to the, our university and also to invite some people from here to spend a time in our university. So, I want to show a little bit about our graduate program in genetics and plant breeding, and also some of ACE, well, AIMS, and in the final of my presentation, the idea is to present two of our uh, two research lines that you have developed. So before that, I would like to show and a brief overview of Brazil, about Brazilian agriculture. So in the beginning, from uh, our colonization until 30, 40 years ago, most of our agriculture was located in this part of Brazil. In the sound of Brazil, when you have like a temperate uh, climate or different weather. So well-defined uh, seasons, and in this region, we had just one growing season. The main reason that it was uh, located in this part was we had only cultivars adapt adapted for that areas, and also we didn't have technology to expand our agriculture for this area that we call Cerrado, that is similar with uh, savannas. Then in 97s, 90s, 80s, uh, with the support of Embrapa and some universities like Exalc, Vissosa, and when some institutes like Campinas, it was possible to develop a soil uh, a package of soil management and develop some cultivars that were adapted for this region. Then our agriculture starts to expand for these areas. And we start also to have a, a shift in the growing seasons. In these areas, they are tropical, and it's possible with some irrigation to have two growing seasons per year. In the first one, that's, uh, that's normally, uh, you see in these regions uh, one, figure, one picture like this. In February, or oh, so, so, sorry, in September, late September or early October, uh, we plan soybean, and this picture represents January or February, when these combines are harvest, harvesting the, the soybean, and right after we have some planting machines for corn, the second growing season. So right after, normally in the same day, we have these this possibilities. And for some regions, which are good investment in irrigation, you can have up to three growing seasons. So it, it made that lots of farmers moved for, for, to these regions and the importance of agriculture to Brazil became, became much more tropical than temperate. Normal, these areas represent much more importance for rice nowadays, for some fruits and beef cattle. And the impact that with this shift, the, the corn due to these new areas and also for the prices for soybean, the corn in the summer uh, has declined over the years and the corn for the second growing season has increased. And the problem is our germoplasm were is not adapted for these tropical regions. Our germoplasm was important direct for the, from the United States. So from like 90s or the 20s, we start to select the specific genotypes for the second growing season. The fat period is totally different. The, the air moisture and the soil moisture and also the night temperature is totally different. 
So it's, it's a huge challenge for us to readapt the corn for the second growing season for these new areas with different soils, different factories. Our college is located in the sound area of Brazil in the beginning of this tropical area, but we have different uh, experimental stations spread in many parts of Brazil and you have conditions to represent this Cerrado or the savanna area of Brazil. And most of our faculty have has, uh, dedicated uh, their time to develop this tropical agriculture since soil management and also the genetics. We have 200 faculty uh, in our college spread in 14 departments. The agriculture, uh, we don't have agriculture department, we have a plant science department, you have a genetics department. So my department is genetics, so we have, our concern is to develop much more models and new techniques to develop new cultivars or new approaches and the other department, the plant science department, has like a closer relationship to the farmers. Considering our performance uh, in, the, in the world contest, in this US rank for the agriculture college, you are normally in fifth or sixth. Of course, uh, I, I know that it's not totally real. Real, uh, this, we have, there are many good agricultural colleges. There are many factors that affect our rank. So I know that probably you are not the fifth or the sixth, but for me, I can understand that it means you have done a good job in the tropical areas. And also, if you consider most of the agricultural colleges in the world, normally, the best ranked agricultural college is the ESAL. So if you consider this scenario, we know the importance, uh, the, how we are important for the world in the tropical regions. Our college was founded in like, 1983, uh, and our grad program uh, was it started later in 1964 with the master, then in 17 with the PhD course. Nowadays, we have 40 scholarships from the Brazilian government. It's one agency. From the another agency of the Brazilian government, we have 27, and from the state, 14. So normally, we have 74, 80 grad students, all of them with scholarships. We, ha we are in, 14, in 15 advisors, and since the beginning to today, we have formed more than 1,200 master and PhD uh, in genetics and plant breeding. If you compare our performance with other, uh, to other uh, agriculture colleges in Brazil, so in the first, in the first uh, scenario that we have the, the field weight citation impact, we are here, University of Sao Paulo, the second one, Viçosa, Lavras, and Rio de Janeiro. We have, in the impact, if you consider our impact, uh, consider all, uh, all the colleges in the world, in the agricultural colleges, we have the twofold, if you consider Vissosa. And also, this represents the last two and a half years of our publications. So it represents the, the, the present, the present of, our, of our publications. And uh, Considering the whole set of publications, 65% was already cited. So we publish, and these publications are promptly accepted for the international community. These publications uh, were cited for more than 58 <coughs> countries. So it, for me, it means that we are not producing only science for Brazil. You are only pr producing science for many countries in the world. Uh, Moreover, 10% of our population, oh, 35, 36% of our publication in journals with like considered the 10% best uh, journals like Tag and Frontiers or any other uh, good journal in the agricultural area. And 40%, almost 40% of our papers has like international collaboration. What are our research lines? We divide our program into three main research lines. The first one, quantitative genetics and plant breeding, when you have five, where you have five professors, 
from quantitative genetics in polyploids. Gabriel Margarido, advisor of one of our students that's uh, here, bioinformatics in polyploids. Potato breeding, it, I'm here, quantitative genetics in corn breeding. The second group is molecular genetics in biological systems, so from transgenics, omics, to cytogenetics. In the third one, evolution, population genetics, and cytogenetics. So the most important for us is the red words than the blue ones. Because as you are in a genetics department, the most important for us is the approach, the methods, than the crop by itself. This part of the crop to develop the management, to develop these uh, uh, farm solutions, there, are, there is another department, as I said, called the plant science department. But we have a good relationship with them. It's also one of our professors, Piotr, is from the other department. So we have a, a good connection to create like one solution, but different ways to see the, this, this problem. Also, we offer a great set of sit, uh, disciplines or subjects for our students. I, from my point of view, I divide these subjects in two parts, or in two groups. The basic disciplines that create the structure, we have 12 disciplines from biometric, cytogenetics, evolution, from plant breeding methods, where I understand that these subjects are more stable, classical knowledge, that over the years there are, there, there's little change. And also you have the supply subjects more technological that over the years or even for one year to another that this discipline is, is offered, you can change almost everything. For instance, my, my discipline is hydropool phenotyping. If I consider the first time that I offer for the last one, I almost replace everything because the technology improved very fast, so the algorithm, the ways to, to find a solution, so. From 19 disciplines directing your department. Of course, there are, there are many other disciplines that you can find in other departments, like statistics or phytology. So, in total, uh, we believe that we have near to 35 subjects that the students really plant reading can can find from, like in other departments, mixed model, linear models, and so on. Our selection selection process change a lot. Uh, when I start my work as a coordinator, I decided that it's important to be much more international. Not all work only with the best of the Brazilians, but work with the best of the world. So the only way is to start to, uh, to offer our subjects in English and also modify our selection process to be online so anyone, anywhere can apply for a position in our grad program and also offer classes and did reading tests or the interviews in an English way. So it happens once a year uh, in August uh, is the application in the tests, the reading test and the, the oral test in uh, the beginning or early October. The reading test is, is made of 15 questions, six of cell biology, six genetics and three of computation biology. And we decided to open the profile. To, like, decided to, it's important to select different profiles in your grad program. During many, many years, we have like a closed system selects our students. Half of questions of cell biology, biology and in half of genetics. Then you add this computation biology to bring this new uh, new way to analyze and this new knowledge that's so important for plant breeding genetics and also open. The candidate, candidates can choose seven from among these 15, master choose seven, can be six and just one from here or three, two and two, so it's totally open because the idea is to select different profiles and try to find different ways to think about one problem. And for PAG, the idea is we need someone like with a broader knowledge, so nine questions. After the reading, we have the analyze the CV and a short interview, but the, uh, the aim is only to identify the best advisor for each candidate. 
normally it, it's not a, a eliminatory process. It's just classificatory and just to uh, assign better, each candidate a better advisor. Also the project and the advisor are defined after the selection. So more details we have in your web page. So uh, we started to do this process last semester, then we got the first results. We could select one Belgian, one South African. And it, it's a start like uh, slowly, but I believe that over the years, the number of international students will increase in our program, and then we start to be more international, attract more international brains, and help us to create better connections with the world, not only Portuguese people, no, but all, all the world. So, some things that you have worked on. Uh, I will show some two papers that my lab has developed, but that I think they are, uh, they can represent pretty well some the first area of quantitative genetics in plant breeding. The first one, uh, it's a partnership with, between my, my lab and a Texas A&M University with Dr. Rooney. One of my students spent some, some time there and the, they request us to solve a, a simple problem. We know that hydroproof phenotyping, based on the hydroproof phenotype, you can go to the field and evaluate the plants how many times you want. It's not, it's not a destructive way, but we know at the same time, every time that you go to the field collect imagery, we have gigas of data. So it's difficult to analyze, it's difficult to store it, so besides the fact that you can collect as much as we can, it requests computer, it requests time, it requests space to storage all these things. So why not determine the best vegetation, vegetation instance in the number of times that you should go to the field and collect the data? Instead of go to every day or every week, probably there is one time that you can collect your data that represents the most of the traits that are important for your crop. The traits that, are, that we define as important is grain yield in the area under the curve that represents the anthracnose resistance. So we evaluate 32 hybrids and three replicates in college station in Texas. Then we evaluate in different stage like 69, 91 to 127 days after sowing. And for each one of these stages, we create the order mosaic, extract the indices. And we extract six different indices, and you try to combine these two features in different ways. Like one day and one indices. And also to combine more than one day. Like it was like a multi trait combining different measures of the same indice, index in different stages. And also, we try to combine different index, but at the same time or even in different times, like different ways to create a multi-trade uh, index. Also, we compare two ways to analyze, two algorithms, the partial least square regression and machine learning. So, the first thing, what is the best index? We know that the index by itself doesn't mean anything, but it's related with the leaf area index or the chlorophyll content. So there are, we have, it's not cause and effect. We have a, a pathway to explain this, like the grain yield in the index. And we know that most of these index are closely related. And when in our study we found the same result that we can see in many other papers. Over the, the stages, you can see that when the index leaf area and the chlorophyll content tends to increase, the correlation between this index and the grain yield tends to be higher. Only one part that is like is a stable, there's a stable zone for these indexes. Also, the, what we have, we found an opposite thing, but with the same magnitude for anthracnose resistance. But all the indices tend to then be closer related. We estimated the indirect selection for each one of these indices for grain new 
in the resistance part. And tracking us in some indices, you could see that based on the heritability and the correlation between RENU or antrachinose resistance in the heritability of these indi indices, we had a better uh, indirect selection than the, in the direct selection. But the main questions, which is index is, the better, is better? So when we compare all of them, it's the blues, so the deviation of the mean, the, of this treatment from the mean, you could see that there is no difference. Of course, there are some deviations, but these, these deviations are not significant. You could select any one of these. They represent very well one another. So the another question is, if I combine more than one data, for, for instance, 119 with 127, I improve or not my accuracy, like measures over the time. And, also, and you see that there is a, there is a little, there is a difference for antrachnose, but for grain yield, there is no, there is no difference. So, but there is one time that you, you could select just one date. Uh, the, the better scenario, best scenario for antrachnose is 119. And it's not the same for grain new, but you can see here, there is no different for these two dates, but uh, I, it's a previous result that I can identify one time to go to the field and collect the data that represent pretty well others, and also I can select just one index. So what's the, which is the best date and how many indices? So based on the same results, we combine the multi-trade, combine one, two, or three, or all trades together, all indices, indices together. We compare all the fly dates, and finally, we compare all those results for partial least square and machine learning. So, in the end, we conclude that the partial least square is the best method. Provides the best accuracies and also uh, it less time consuming for the computer. It's, it's easier to program, and for breeders, it, it's not like a black box, you know, like, like a, a machine learning. One flight, uh, it's enough. It represents uh, 119 days after, so it's in stage eight, so the hard off. In a single index, like NDVI, the simple one, the most common one, the index, uh, it's, it's enough to it serves to select for a grain new and then track NAS resistance. So this is the first, pro the first paper that you have worked on in a partnership with Texas AM. And the second one is, was developed in a partnership with my lab in the microorganism lab in the, that uh, it's also located in my depart the department of genetics. So I think it's, an, it's a common problem. Nitrogen, it's a common problem uh, around the world. But in Brazil, when the agriculture moved to these tropical areas, the soils tends to be poor in nitrogen. So it's necessary to spend lots of money, and it's not a guarantee that the plants will respond uh, for these inputs. Trying to copy the, the solution that happened for soybean when they apply the resorbium, and like almost 100% of the nitrogen is offered by these bacteria. Some researchers uh, of the microorganism uh, area trying to identify some bacteria that can be associated with cereals. And then identify some years ago as a spirillum. As a spirillum, it's a free living bacteria that doesn't have any specialized structure like rhizobium, so it complicates. Uh, there's relationship, it's complicated, the, the symbiosis establishment. So it's necessary that the genotype, the corn genotype or the cereal genotype create in its rhizosphere a, be a best condition, like uh, releasing some hormones or change the pH or anything else to create a good conditions that the symbiosis starts. Based on that, and talk to my colleagues, and also analyzing the farm results, 
it's well known in Brazil that this association with azospirulin and corn is G by E by E by N, has a G by E by E by N interaction. What means? It depends the strain of the azospirulum, this the hybrid or the variety that you are using, the environment, the, no, the amount of nitrogen, the water, the temperature that you offer to your plants, and also the management. This Sec, this, the, the last part, the E and N, you decide to fix it. If you put lots of nitrogen, you uh, to create a poor, uh, complicated conditions for azospirulum to create this symbiosis. So when you decided to study this symbiosis between corn and azospirulum, you offer a poor condition of nitrogen and try to offer the best ones for the all other inputs. Also, different that you can see for microorganisms, you fix it the, the strain for the bacteria and evaluate the different way, different a panel of corn. Because if it's a G by G uh, interaction, probably there are some research, there are some corn lines or there are some corn hybrids that can perform better than others and it's genetics and it's heritable. So there are some genes that control this trait. So the idea is to understand what's the proportion that is inheritable and if it's inheritable, what are the genes or these NIPs that could be related to that. Also, if, it will ha if you find them, you can use these SNPs for a marker assisted selection and increase the ability or in corn to be like for fitness with this association. So for that, we chose 19 amazing breed lines contrasting for nitrogen use efficiency. So these, these were the parents. And based on that, you made a dialogue. It's imbalanced. It's difficult to create all of them. Even you, you tried, but so we had like 125 hybrids and these hybrids and plus the parents we evaluate with two treatments, and all of them with N stress, but one of them applying the azospirillum brasiliens. This is the strain. We apply when you plant, like trying to uh, mimetize the farmers. They treat the seeds, put in the machines, and plant. Not applying after or create like this is, we're trying to make our research as similar as possible with the farm conditions or procedures to, to uh, in the, under the field conditions. We will evaluate in V7, seven leaves, and we evaluate for plant height and also for many uh, root traits, root length, area, volume, and other water, and root dry mass. Of the parent lines, we also genotype using the F metric as array, 600,000 SNPs. Based on the, the, the results, so based on the, the data collect, we adjust the means using as Remo to collect the blues. Then uh, using the, the farm CPU, that's uh, a well-known package for GWAST, you consider our two methods to analyze the importance of these uh, genotype metrics. The most common one proposed by Van Hayden some year, years ago, like for the additive effect when the most important thing is increase the number of copies of one specific allele. In the second one that it's then try to represent the importance of heterosis is if you are heterozygo heterozygous, it's much better because you can uh, collect, you can uh, get the dominance effect. But if you are homozygous, it's not, a, it's not good for your performance. So you rearrange your metrics for these two farms. After you collect or uh, identify these NIPs, then you have evaluated uh, what, the, what, the, what the position for them, which genes are closer, and also which kind of uh, products they, they probably uh, they might be released. So just to clarify, the idea is if I increase the number of copies, I increase or I improve the performance of my, my journal lines. 
And the second way to analyze your data is this one, where the most important is to collect or to get the dominance. So, in the end, we have six traits, two treatments, two models, 24 in total. For all then, you could find some beautiful hits and a good adjustment for that. And the most important thing is here. You could identify SNPs specifically related for when you inoculate with the bacteria, the plant reacts totally different. And it's, it's amazing. Some plants react in a good way, identify that as a spirulum with a plant growth bacteria, communicate with the bacteria, and improve their performance. On the other hand, we have many genotypes that understood that this kind of bacteria is like an enemy. Activate the immunological system, spend a lot of energy trying to combine, trying to avoid the bacteria, and the performance tends to be poor. So we have different reactions, but you could identify some SNPs related for even uh, for additive, for the heterozygosum, for the heterozygous model, and specific SNPs for each one. And different kinds of hormones or aquaparin and proteins related for this fitness between corn and the bacteria. Another thing, it's, is there any relation between these NIPs uh, find for with the inoculation or not? So in the additive model, we found two SNPs that are common, but most of these NIPs that we found are specifically for each condition. So they are differentially expressed due to the bacteria inoculation. The, in the heterozy heterozygous model, it was much more extremely. You could find 34 SNPs, but no, there is no coincidence in the brain. And the total 34 SNPs for the, uh, additive, the heterozygous model and 11 for the additive. And the coincidence between these two models was zero. So when you model the genotype matrix, you can identify different markers. We can identify markers more related for dominance and more markers more related for the additive. And you can combine both to improve a way, the way to select the best, best genotypes. So our main conclusions for that, it's possible to improve the tropical corn, but not to, only for improve the yield, but to have a better fitness in the symbiosis between bacteria, bacteria and corn. And also, most of the, the SNPs that we found, uh, it's in a heterozygous model and mostly uh, provides an advantage. If you are heterozygous, tend to you, you tends to be tends to have a better performance. And considering how you can accomplish this in a breeding model, so if you have you are selecting one genotype that was identified in a heterozygous model, it's necessary to select for each heterotic group. Uh, one different allele. So the idea is to select in heterot group A for one allele and the B another allele when you make a cross to obtain your single, so single cross or your hybrid, you are going to have this heterozygous uh, form. And for those SNPs that you, the most important thing is the dosage, you select for the same allele in both heterotic groups. So it like matches with the idea of reciprocal recurrent selection in corn. And to finish my presentation, uh, so Brazil, like other countries, we have, we ha Brazil has lots of challenges. And mainly, the main thing that you have, to, you should keep in mind that Brazil is considered uh, one of the countries that keeps the most important rainforest in the world. So maybe, our main question for us is how to accomplish the agricultural development and maintain not only the rainforest, but all other uh, biomes that we have in our country. It's complicated nowadays, mainly for political issues or for grants that you have received to develop for research lines, but from any university of, uh, point of view, most of our research 
trying to combine these things in a smooth way. We have is still available in Brazil, 90 of 200 million hectares. So we have lots of land that can be used for agriculture. And this doesn't account for forests or these parts that should be or must be maintained as wild as possible. Tropical areas are challenging, not only because you move our agriculture, but because in these new areas, we have a great variability of weather. So if you consider in southern part, we have a stable weather, just one kind of weather for this whole part. But when you go to the tropical areas, we can have different scenarios for weather and for the soil. And also, if you consider how the weather changes over the year and you can have up to three growing seasons, you can combine all this weather, soil, and growing season in a matrix, so the number of possibilities increase a lot. So we have a great variability of conditions, and for us, it's a great source of a hypothesis. So Brazil, from my point of view, of course, <laughs> and I hope uh, you agree with me, it's a great place to invest in agriculture. It's a great place where you can find new hypotheses, not only for Brazil, but for the, all the tropical areas. So. The idea is, if you want, you can work together. We have lots of things to do together, and you are open to receive us in your home and make connections. Thank you.